Over the years, I've had a chance to play a lot of roguelikes. Roguelikes that deal with planes, roguelikes that deal with trains, roguelikes that deal with automobiles, uh, spaceship roguelikes, hand-to-hand -hand roguelikes, RPG roguelikes, first-person shooter roguelikes, platformer roguelikes, and I guess the point is we've played a lot of them. And there's one kind of a, a dream concept that I still see developers are trying to chase after. And that is combining the hard-coded, highly crafted world of Zelda with the complete open-ended and procedural or ram randomly generated design of a roguelike. Now, you would think that these two just squashed together would create the ultimate dream game. Like someone saying, I want to combine Bloodborne with Fortnite and give me uh, the Last of Us story and uh, Family Matters as well. And it will be the greatest video game ever made. But, as we all know, it doesn't work out that way. And for today's video, I want to talk about why these two elements are a lot harder than you would think to combine. And it has to deal with the nature of roguelike or procedurally based content design. Now, in previous talks we've had on this topic, we've brought about how when it comes to any roguelike, like however you want to describe it, design, there are always two kinds of elements that go into the generation and are built into the algorithm. You have soft elements that kind of define the overall structure of the game space without necessarily changing the gameplay. And then you have the hard elements that will either radically change what the player is doing or impact the player's overall strategies. So one of the perfect examples of this is the indie survival horror game Darkwood, which if you don't know it, you can either look it up on Steam or we have videos here on the channel. In Darkwood, the map itself is procedurally built on each new game. With that said though, the elements that make up the map are pretty much hard-coded. The, the game literally calls them points of interest, be it a, a resource supply over here, a decrepit building that can show up down here, you get the picture. The point is that the soft elements is the actual overall game space. What am I exploring? The hard elements are those points of interest that define what I can and can't do at any point and what are my overall goals. Minecraft is another example of this. Despite how majestic and amazing the procedural generation of that world is, every time you start playing the game you're going to be punching a tree to get wood. Doesn't matter where that tree spawns, doesn't matter the entire uh, region that you're in, you have to do the same thing every time. That is a hard element. Again, it also is the difference between the design of a biome and the place of a biome in a game. So the point with all that said is that when it comes to building a good roguelike experience, it all comes down to how many different ways can I challenge the player or impact the general gameplay loop. Everything else is window dressing. If the sky is blue, green, yellow, turquoise, rainbow, magenta, it doesn't matter. That's not changing what I'm doing in this game. It's changing you know, the color of the sky, but how does that affect the gameplay loop? Again, it doesn't. And this is the nature of the issue that I see when it comes to this idea of a Zelda Rogue. Most Zelda Rogues are built on the same formula, that the overworld is going to be procedurally or randomly generated. The actual points of interest, the dungeons, the quests, the bosses, those are hard-coded hard elements. They are knowns that will not change. The issue is that these two uh, differing forces cannot work easily together. If, for instance, I need, or any roguelike based game, let's say I need five items. Every time I play the game, I must get those five items or I'm not going to beat the game. Everything else surrounding them is completely ancillary. Doesn't matter if you put a point of interest here, 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 and here because I'm still having to do them in the same order get those same items. It could be over here, it could be there, it could be everywhere. But the problem is that because those are the hard elements that define the experience, 
that's what's going to be the player's focus. Not whether or not they go left, right, up, down, or right, down, right, left when they first start playing the game. More importantly, this also affects the progression curve. When we look at the typical Zelda format, it's always a layering or foundation effect. You get one item, that unlocks the next item, that unlocks the next item, that unlocks the next one. You get the Master Sword, you go after Ganon, you get the Triforce, you win, everybody's happy. In that kind of formula, it allows the developer to keep on growing the difficulty and the complexity of the game. Once I introduce the hookshot, I can now have hookshot challenges be part of the normal uh, ex exploration or transversal, or be featured in more dungeons. I can't include those elements before they're introduced, that's poor pacing. And as a developer, when you have that linear format, it allows you to be more creative with your designs. This is why we see many interesting takes when it comes to puzzle platforming, or first person puzzle games like Portal or the Talos Principle. Because you're constantly building and layering your challenges based on your existing mechanics. One of the reasons why Spelunky continues to hold up well is that the core gameplay loop is solid. It's never changed, it's never altered, it doesn't grow. But everything that tests the player's mastery on those elements is constantly changing based on what levels are being built. Now, when it goes back to the Zelda formula trying to combine roguelike elements, if the game space is being randomly or procedurally generated, it means you cannot do more interesting elements. Because interesting usually means hard-coded or by hand. One of the reasons why Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and the like works so well in terms of providing this interesting set of challenges is that it is 100% hard-coded in terms of its environmental and obstacle design. You cannot do that level of detail and make it be procedurally built. Bloodborne tried this with the Chalice Dungeons, and even though it's still an interesting challenge, it's not being different on each time you play. An expert player starts to pick up on the same ticks or trends that pop up in a procedural dungeon. And then it's just a matter of knowing, okay, if I ever see environment A, that means that that's going to lead to the boss door. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And again, we see this with many roguelikes that focus more on the environmental design rather than the core gameplay loop. This is the difference, again, between lesser action roguelikes and something like Dead Cells or The Bind of Isaac. In Dead Cells, my path through that game is fixed. I know exactly what biomes I'm going to go through. I can tell or I can expect what enemies are going to show up. But what items I get are rather going to change my game. If I get uh, a colorless the Spartan kick item, that's going to mean a different strategy than if I got the auto crossbow. Because of those elements, they are hard elements because they change what I'm doing in that game. Now with that said, we're going to turn to a recent example of a game we played that tried to capture that Zelda Rogue approach. We're going to talk about why it doesn't work and why the answer to making this work is far more complicated than I think most people realize. But first, let's do a quick shout out to our Patreon backers. And now a quick shout out to our supporters over on patreon.com slash gwbicer. This is footage of the game Songbringer that we played on stream recently. And this is a, another example of a game that's trying to combine the random or procedural nature of a roguelike with the handcrafted design of a Zelda. And you can even see by kind of like the environmental cues and what we're doing, it does very much look like an old school Zelda, although with far more interesting pixel graphics. The game works in terms of its procedural generation by when you start the title, you have to earn a five uh, numeral or five uh, variable code. And that creates the seed that generates the world. From there, that seed is fixed. If I give someone the same five characters, it's going to give them the exact same world. Now within this world, the entire game space, or the entire overworld itself, is randomly built. But there are hard-coded points of interest, as we talked about in the last part, that are sprinkled throughout. 
These are the dungeons that you have to explore. These are shops or quest givers or people on the map that provide you with tips. Those elements, such as this guy right here, this is a fixed part. He's going to show up in different spots, but this event is going to play out the same way every time. Now, as we said in the last part, the problem when it comes to combining Zelda with roguelike design is that the Zelda formula relies on this progression curve of growth. You have to not only provide the player with new elements, but they also have to start testing the player and being integrated into the gameplay. With a game like Songbringer, you're going to be spending a lot of time wandering around the overworld, and it doesn't really do all that much. Again, the points of interest are, well, without any other better term, they're the interesting elements of your game. Another issue is that if specific points of interest require an item or an upgrade to get, it can be hard for the player to know whether or not they're able to do something, even though they may have found them in an out-of-order way. And this can be very frustrating to say that I'm in this spot, but I can't do it, but I don't know if that's even possible or not. And the issue that we run into, and this is the same thing we ran into with the game Darkwood, that we mentioned earlier, that even though the environment is changing on each play, the points of interest are still fixed elements. So I'm still doing the same things. It's just that instead of going northwest to find an item, I may be going southeast. And those uh, kinds of shuffling things around don't make the game any more interesting. And when you have those limitations, it gets to the point where it would just be better to have the map be hard-coded and be more diverse rather than trying to force the roguelike elements. Now, as I said at the end of the last part, there could be a way of getting this to work, but most people aren't going to like this answer. Because the points of interest define and change the experience, the only way I could see the idea of a Zelda Rogue working is that you define a game essentially around, let's say, 50 to 100 points of interest. They'll give a new item, there'll be a new challenge, you get the picture. But the game, when it generates the world, may only use 15 to 25 of those experiences. And then, what happens, of course, is that each time you play the game, you're going to get a completely different pool of things to experience, which in turn give you a completely different experience. Now, before any developers start running off and stealing that idea, it's important to realize what I just described. You are basically going to be creating a highly polished, almost like on par with a Zelda experience, and then building a procedural um, algorithm on top of that that can still balance the game around no matter what choices it gives the player. Basically, in other words, I just said, why don't you build a completely persistent open-world multiplayer game in 15 hours? It is not easy to do, and may even be impossible to get all those elements right. And we'll begin to wrap things up here. As we head into, again, this is a fixed element. Whenever I'm assuming whenever you go down to this dungeon, you get this cutscene. But the idea of a Zelda rogue is a white whale when it comes to game development. Again, it's the idea of creating the game that is infinitely replayable. And for people watching this, can you think of other white whale kind of concepts when it comes to game design? But with these kinds of games, it's important to understand why somebody plays them in the first place. And if you try to push the design in too many different directions, you may remove the elements that got people to play in the first place. This is why many games that try to completely merge 100% action-based design with pure RPG abstraction tend to be very polarizing experiences. Because if someone's going to play a pure action game like Bayonetta or Borderlands, or I'm sorry, not even Borderlands, like God of War Ninja Gaiden, they don't want an RPG layer that says, oh, you can't do this yet, you need to go grind enemies. And likewise, if somebody's playing a hardcore RPG like Etrian Odyssey, Final Fantasy, Dragon Warrior, they don't want to be being tested to get proper positioning and timing as in a Dark Souls game. And 
who knows, maybe somebody will prove me wrong at some point. But, with all the world likes I've played, I haven't quite seen it yet. But, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to suggest a topic for me to cover in another video, let me know in the comments below. Come back for daily discussions on game design here. And check out our Discord and Patreon, all that great stuff linked down below. But until next time, have a great night. If you're looking for another book about game design, be sure to check out my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, out now. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.